Okay. Hey, just want to remind you again tonight that uh, you can raise your hand, you can ask questions. Uh, we've got microphone runners, yes, that will be taking microphones around. And, uh, but for them to see you, you've got to raise your hand pretty high, wave it pretty hard, just like this gentleman right here. Okay, there you go. So, uh, and then we'll get the microphone to you and you can ask. And it actually is super helpful for me uh, as I teach to kind of get a sense of what you're catching, what you're not catching, and uh, maybe some questions we should have asked. So feel free to do that. Hey, real quick as we kind of dive in, um, again, just want to remind you, 20th anniversary, there are no morning services. We're doing one huge combined service at Tumbleweed Park in the evening. We're a little bit concerned that maybe we haven't gotten that information out enough and clearly enough. Uh, in any church family like ours, you've got people who are here every Sunday. Uh, they would have heard all the announcements. But you've got groups of people that kind of float in and float back out like every five, six weeks type of a thing. And we're a little worried that we could have a thousand plus people show up on the parking lot on Sunday morning and go, hey, wait a minute, what happened to the church? They closed down. And... Uh, <clears throat> So what we're asking you to help us do, over the next couple of days, we've got a whole bunch of stuff that's gonna hit Facebook, and I think I've got an email that went out today. If you can just share things voraciously, that anything that hits you, rather than delete it, which I know what you do all the time anyways, but this time, instead of deleting, if you could share it so that we could just inundate everybody who has any contact with Cornerstone to say, hey guys, please don't show up in the morning. We don't want you to be discouraged. You got the kids ready. Uh, just get ready for the evening uh, service. And then just to tell you guys, uh, it's kind of interesting because the production team wants to keep everything secret, and so they won't let me tell you what's going on. But they have put together an amazing service uh, for the evening. And uh, I believe you and I are going to mark this one in our calendar and say, I was there when. And I just think it's going to be an amazing, amazing service. So don't don't let anything preclude you from making it to this particular service. I think it's going to be one of our landmark moments together as a congregation. And honestly, and I'm, I'm going to invite you guys to pray because you guys are kind of the inner circle on the deal. Uh, the conversation that I'm planning to have over at the park with the greater uh, uh, body of our church is simply uh, this challenge that 20 years ago, 26 people gathered together in a living room and said, what would happen if we started a church? And, and would you be willing to be part of that? And as we asked that question, everybody in the room knew that this wasn't gonna be easy. We knew it was gonna take commitment. We knew it was gonna take sacrifice, but we all believed that God could do something pretty cool with us. We had no idea it was gonna be this. I mean, no one ever dreamed this, but we, we had a sense God could do something cool. And the question we're going to ask over at Tumbleweed Park together as a church is to say, if God could do this with 26, what would happen if 7,000 put their hands together and said, we will live sacrificially, we will live committed to the purposes of God, and let's see what God could do in 20 more years? And guys, I'm just telling you, if we would take that challenge as a church, I don't, I don't know that anybody's ever seen that happen before. And how cool would that be if you and I were the ones to do that? So we're just going to have that conversation together at Tumbleweed Park um, and hopefully leave there a different group of people because we will have joined together 7,000 strong, put our hands in and said, we don't believe God's even begun to do with us what God's going to do with us, and we're in for the next 20. So I think it's going to be a great, great day. Please be there. Encourage others. Tell them about the time. And then the, the last thing I just want to say real quick tonight, too. Right now, guys, our church just has huge favor from God. And you're not hearing me say that lightly, and I'm not one of these overly mystical guys. I'm just telling you, God has been, man, just doing incredible, incredible things in this place. Uh, the Mary's Challenge, I think I told you a little bit about it. We had, we had hundreds of families. We, we continue to get emails from marriages going, hey, the papers were on the counter. Uh, we were done. Yeah. And it's just been totally turned around. And so it's super exciting. I mean, super exciting to see the differences that have happened uh, there. Last uh, Friday, and I don't know if you guys are aware of this, uh, but last Friday in this very room, uh, we had nearly a thousand fifth and sixth grade students. And uh, what that was about was uh, our fifth and sixth grade ministry actually contacted many of the 
elementary schools in the Chandler and Gilbert School District. And again, guys, I just think this is favor of God. And they were given permission to come and do assemblies um, on their school campuses. Now, the assemblies they did were, were basically neutral. In other words, they were just saying very positive things like be responsible and, you know, um, rise to the occasion. They were saying very, very just positive message type things. But the great part was that out of that, they were then able to say to all of those students, hey, uh, if you enjoyed this assembly, uh, we've got this amazing thing happening over at Cornerstone next Friday night. And so they had the opportunity to invite thousands and thousands of fitness careers. We had nearly a thousand of them in this room, uh, an amazing event they called Glow Mania. And uh, I think they said they had um, five or 600 first time visitors, kids who had never been on our campus, almost 200 kids came to the Lord in this room last Friday night. Yeah. Um, last night, last night we had almost a thousand ladies in this room doing Bible study together. So just cool, cool stuff. And, and guys, all, all, that, all that to just say, you and I are in a moment where God is just doing unbelievable stuff in our church. And the only way for us to mess that up is not be faithful with God, what God gave us. To somewhere say, oh, you know, it's a lot of work to work with God. And uh, we're just not going to say that. And I say that in this moment because uh, one of the conversations we're going to have in the next couple weeks, you, you all know we're in the middle of a building project. If you go to this side, you can see the three brand new buildings going up. They were building walls today. I mean, it's exciting. But our building pledges have been coming in at about 60% of what we pledged. Now, we knew going in, you, you never get 100%. Uh, but nobody ever considered we'd get 60%, which means there's a significant, significant portion of people who pledged and haven't followed through on their pledge. Here's where that creates a dilemma for us, is that as we go out to finalize the loans, the lending institutions are saying, it doesn't look like your people are in. Uh, it doesn't look like you're bringing enough to the table. And now we're getting hesitation from the lending agencies because we're not making our down payment where it needs to be. So we're gonna have a real frank conversation in the next few weeks to say, guys, uh, we get to figure this out. We get to figure out how before the end of the year, we can make up a big chunk of what we haven't given. Uh, because if we don't, uh, this thing has all the potential to just kind of go on hold. And here's why, guys, I think that's critical. It's not, it's not about brick and mortar. It's about having a chair for someone to hear about Jesus. And that's a completely different thing. And every one of us is sitting in this room, unless you were here when we built this room. Uh, how many were here when we built this room? You were in the old auditorium. Okay, so there's a chunk of us. Everybody who couldn't raise their hand, you realize you're sitting in a chair that somebody else bought you. And now it's our turn. It's our turn to buy a chair for those who haven't made it to the room yet so that they can have the conversation that they haven't had yet. And guys, I, I, I refuse to not change Chandler for Jesus Christ because we didn't have a seat. That's just the wrong answer. I refuse to turn children away from our children's buildings because the rooms are full. It's just the wrong answer. And so guys, I'm just saying to you, we're stewarding a moment of grace and a moment of favor with God and the only way for us to screw this up is to say to God, hey God, it's really inconvenient for you to be blessing this much. So we're gonna finish it, we're gonna build the buildings, but it means you and I are gonna dig down deep and we're gonna do some sacrificing and we're going to, some of us that have already been faithful are gonna be more faithful. Some of us who have forgotten are gonna remember and we're gonna get this done. So why, here's why I say it to you, because my hope is that every person in this room, because again, guys, you are inner core, I would hope that every one of us is being faithful right now. I need you to pray. I need you to pray for everybody who's slacking and just say, God, remind them. Remind them what we're doing. Remind them how important this is. Remind them how critical it is for us to be the church in a dark, dark world. And I'm gonna ask you to be prayer warriors for the next six or seven weeks as we have this conversation and try to get this money together before the end of the year, all right? Yes? And they nodded their heads and said, oh yeah, we're in, Pastor. All right, all right, all right, here we go. Let's go to the book of Romans. We're gonna dig in. Uh, Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18. I'm going to back up for a second. We're not going to spend much time there. Don't get freaked out. I just want to be sure that we're on course together, and then we're going to pick up right where we left off last week. 
we said to you that the book of Romans has been, was used for years and years and years to train defense attorneys in how to build good prosecutions. We then said to you that actually as we get through Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2, uh, we're going to run into three distinct groups that Paul is going to convict of sin. He's going to convict them of being in need of God because their spiritual lives are in failure. And so we've been unpacking that first group of people. So I want us to go back. It's in verse 18. And I want you to take a look there and see if you can figure out who is this first group of people that Paul has been saying, this group of people is in trouble with God. So here's the verse. Let me read it, and then I'll let you guys take some guesses, see if we can figure it out. Here's what it says. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. It says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So if you were going to kind of put a word to characterize this first group of people, who would they be? Everyone. Nope. Huh? Pagans. Pagans. So this group of people, let's read it again. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And this first group of people that Paul is bringing into conviction, that he's going to try before the court of God's tribunal, are really just pagans. These are guys who are out living by their own ways, their own cares. They have no regard for God. They're going to do their own thing. They're going to live. Remember, remember it said here, uh, as we went through the passage, remember they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they begin to wor worship created things instead of worshiping the Creator. So they've, they, they've moved into paganism or into idol worship. And this first group of people are, this, are a pagan group that are as far away from God as they can possibly be. And Paul is in the process of saying, hey, uh, you're in trouble. If you're going to live a godless life, if you're going to live a life with no regard for God whatsoever, you just need to know that that life leads you to a dead end. And this is important because all of us have people in our lives that go, well, no, I, I, don't, think I, I don't think God exists, right? I mean, I'm not sure he's there. And if he is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly not paying much attention to him. And what Paul is saying in this moment is that is a reckless stance for you. If you decide that's your final verdict, your final vote, that you're going to say, hey, I'm going to live my life as if God is not there. You realize that leads you to a horrific outcome. You realize you will be found guilty one day if that's how you choose to live your life. Okay. Um, it says about this, this particular group of people that they suppress the truth uh, in their wickedness, verse 18, since what may be known about God is plain or should have been obvious to them because God's made it plain to them for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen and understood from what had been made from the creation of in other words, men and women should, even if, even if they'd never heard the Bible, even if nobody had ever preached to them, just looking at creation, they should have been able to figure some things out about a supernatural being that was different than them as human beings, uh, should have been clear to them, understood from what had been made, so that nobody or everybody is without excuse for denying the existence of God. Now, we said there's three things that every person should know simply by looking at creation if they were simply being honest about what they're seeing in creation. Does anyone think they can remember what those three things were that everybody should know? Anybody think they can do that? Okay, we got one hand over here. Let's give it a try. We've got a hand over here. Mike Runners, run. Run. This is what you are being paid thousands of dollars to do is Run to the hands that are being lifted, right there. Okay, give me the three things you think that uh, everybody should know just by looking at creation. I'm cheating though. Oh, you're cheating. Pulled it down, don't look at it. <laughs> powerful. There's someone powerful, more powerful than them. A designer. <laughs> okay. And, uh-oh, bigger. Bigger, all right, there you go. Okay, 
Three things that everybody ought to be able to figure out if you just simply look at creation honestly is, hey, there's somebody stronger than me. Because I can't, I can't even lift a big tree, let alone a mountain. I can't possibly throw a planet into, into space. I cannot create anything from nothing. You realize that as humans, we are always limited to make. Make means you take materials that are already there and you reform them. But there is no human who can create. Take nothing and make it something. So there's someone more powerful than me. There's somebody, and, and I would argue, and I think it was good, a designer, by looking at the intricacy of creation, looking at the fact that I can't even describe to you how DNA works. Some people are getting closer to that, but you realize the intricacy of this is absolutely absurd that it came from randomness and evolution because design demands a designer, and there's nobody in this room who could have designed the entire met metabolic system within a person, all of the uh, veins and arteries. There's no one who could have come up with this. They, someone must be smarter than us to have pulled all this together. And then the last part is when you look at the vastness of the universe, because of the fact that you and I can't even travel uh, to the sun, uh, we can't even travel out of our solar system. I mean, the vastness of this thing is so incredible. This person, by all thought, by all logic, has to be bigger than us, okay? So stronger than us, smarter than us, bigger than us. And everybody, if you're just simply being honest with the information that creation gives us, should have known there's someone out there who's bigger, smarter, stronger than you and I are. Okay. All right. Let's jump down, kind of catch up where we were. Uh, let's go to verse, um, uh, let me read this real quick and then we'll, we'll dig in. All right. So starting in uh, verse 21. <clears throat> For though they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave him thanks in their thinking, they became futile and foolish and darkened their hearts. And although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity. And here's the reason I want us to just review this together. I think, okay, you don't have to agree with this, but I think when you read Romans 1, you're seeing a progression into sin that they started out fairly innocent, uh, looking at creation, not necessarily wanting to be accountable to that God that was bigger and stronger and smarter than them. And in that moment, they pushed it away, they suppressed it. But that the natural outcome of pushing God away is that you always then pull sin in. There's always gonna be something in that void in our lives. And because of this, they now move in a progression of going further and further. They begin to worship things that weren't God. They begin to then pursue their lusts. They then get into things that nobody was supposed to be in. And you see, I think, this natural descent, this natural progression further and further into sin. And here's why I think this is important. Because you and I know people who are struggling in their lives right now. And what you need to be aware of is there's no such thing as staying stagnant spiritually. Even when you feel like you're stagnant, you're not stagnant. The closest I can describe this is like being on a hill on a pair of roller skates. The moment you think you're not, you're actually rolling backwards. And I'm just gonna say this to you guys, if, if you feel like you're stagnant in your, in your spiritual life, right, you're not stagnant, you're losing ground because following God is always skating uphill. And if you're not putting in the time, and if you're not putting in the effort, you're losing ground. That's why it's so critical to do your daily devotions. It's so critical to be in prayer. It's so critical to be in the house of God and to be studying. And that's why church isn't an optional thing because the minute you relax, the minute you say, hey, I'm just gonna go and cruise for a while, you are losing ground. I think this applies to some of our friends who are far from God, because what you need to know is where they are today is not where they will be tomorrow. And you will either be the influence in their lives that begins to nudge them and push them closer to God and closer to a decision to follow God, but to stay uninvolved in their lives 
probably means that they will continue to move further and further away from God because there really is no such thing as being stagnant spiritually. It's always either a progression down or a progression up. Verse 24, therefore God gave them over to sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They worshiped and served created things uh, rather than the one who created, who is forever to be praised, amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with the women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. I think that's pretty much where we got last week, so here we go. Verse 28, furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do that which ought not to be done. And I think what's being described here when it talks about a depraved mind is the furthest place you can go in this progression. Who knows what depraved is? What's depraved? Anybody know? Okay, we got a microphone. Let's run. A dollar if you can get there now. All right. All right, what's depraved? Give me a depraved definition. I think a depraved mind is someone who's completely uh, turned their back on God, given over to their sinful desires com in a complete way. Okay. I think, that's, I think that's a really close definition. It's a pretty good working one. Anyone want to add anything to that? What would it be to be a depraved mind? Another term for this that sometimes get used is a reprobate mind. A reprobate, that, but that's kind of old 1700s, but depraved mind or a reprobate mind. All right, we got one here, what do you think? I would say it would be just lacking judgment and things. Okay. And I'd also like to comment too on the sliding on the hill doesn't the word say in there, I don't know where it is, but do not forsake the gathering of the believers. Hebrews because chapter if, 10, yeah. If we were doing that, we wouldn't have that problem of hiding or sin or whatever we're doing. We mm. would constantly be held accountable. Just a thought. Yeah. <laughs> we'll let it linger. <clears throat> Okay, so depraved or reprobate mind. Here's the best way I can describe it, guys. And we got close. I, I love where we were at. We're, we're in the ballpark. The best I can define a reprobate or depraved mind is simply this, that I have lost the ability to hear my conscience. And we say that again. I have lost the ability to hear my conscience. Good and evil, right and wrong, no longer have any bearing for me. They look the same. I can justify anything that I do. I can tell you, and there, I have lost any sense of real morality in my life, which is scary. How do you get there? How, how do you get to a reprobate mind? How do you get to a depri depraved mind? And I, and I think you've got a little bit of a hint here. You know, you've seen this group of people who were pushing God away, and they keep getting just a little deeper, a little darker. You, re you realize, here, guys, here's the deal with sin. One good sin always deserves another. Have you noticed that? It's really hard to sin just once and not follow it up with a couple others. You know, you tell a lie, and then someone says, well, hey, but what about, well, no, I didn't really mean that. I meant blah, blah, blah. And then someone else says, well, wait a minute, you weren't there on Tuesday, though. You, well, no, it was Tuesday afternoon. I'll be, I'll be right. One good sin always leads to another. And, and, and you begin to make this progression as you kind of pile them up. Did we have a microphone over here? Say it real loud. Yeah. Oh, we're going to give him the microphone. Okay. Because it was, it was actually good what he said. I said, you, you actually, it's a choice. You choose to ignore God and follow your own devices. Uh, yeah. And it's a conscious choice that you make to do that. Yeah. Here, here let, let me see if I can describe how this happens, guys. Because this, this, this ought to cause some of us to stop and pause and consider. That's an arm. Um, <clears throat> 
I went to seminary, not to art school, okay? But, but here's, what, here's what happens, and God's kind of designed our, our human anatomy this way. If I were to take a knife and uh, cut somebody in the arm, and so now I give them this cut, what does the body intuitively do? It heals, but when, when the body heals after it's been cut, does it heal so that it looks exactly like it did before? Scar. And here's why the body does that. The body says, hey, wait a minute, whatever that was that happened the last time, that was unpleasant. So I'm going to make sure that I put even tougher tissue in that location because I don't want to feel that same pain again. So it deposits scar tissue. The, the skin that's there is thicker, it's rougher it, 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 than what, what was originally in that place. When you're sitting in church, when you're reading your Bible, and the Holy Spirit goes, moment of conviction. Hey, you know you shouldn't be living that way in your life. Hey, you know that was a lie. Hey, you know you were dishonest when. You've got two options. One option is to say, God, you are exactly right. You, you are exactly right, that was wrong. It's called confession, right? God, what you said is true, what I did wasn't. And then repentance, and repentance is simply saying, I did that, but I'm choosing not to do that anymore. I'm turning away from that sinful behavior, repentance. If you do that, the amazing thing that happens spiritually is that, oof, oh, there it is. Whoop that one. The Holy Spirit comes and heals that moment in your life without scar tissue. That part of your heart still stays soft and tender because you responded to the prompting to the Holy Spirit. The problem comes when the Holy Spirit comes and convicts you about something and you say, nah, nah, I think I'm going to do that again. I think I'm still going to date them. I don't think I'm going to listen to that passage of Scripture. Uh, we call this being a selective believer. And you realize the vast, vast, vast majority of Christians, and we're going to talk about this in a few weeks in church, but uh, the vast majority of Christians in church are selective believers. And what I mean by that is this. Some people are baby Christians. And, and you just got to understand, they're baby Christians, which means they're going to poop on everything and throw up on everything. That's just what baby Christians do. But you can't blame them because they're baby Christians. That's, that's what they do. But there comes this next step. It's called being a teenager uh, in spiritual terms, where you become a selective believer. And what you do in that moment of your Christian walk, if you're not careful, is you go, oh, that's, that's a stinky passage. Man, if I weren't God, I wouldn't have written that. So here's my answer. I'm choosing not to obey it. And we pick and choose which parts of the Bible we want to obey. I mean, think about this for a second. <laughs> because I've lived all 40 years of my life, or whatever it is you've lived, I'm pretty sure I am darn smarter than God. And so I just, I just choose not to follow that bit of his advice. I'm a selective believer. I pick and choose which parts of God I want to obey and Scripture. Here's the problem when you and I do that. The minute you and I do that to the Holy Spirit, your heart begins to form scar tissue because your heart says, I don't ever want to feel convicted about that again. The next time the preacher opens up that passage, my heart's going to be ready to resist. I've already come up with my three excuses why God was wrong. And I'm going to tell you that the next time the Lord comes to convict you about that, it will not penetrate as deeply and now you sit through another sermon and you didn't like that one and you read your Bible and one of your devotionals and you didn't like that one and you know what, God just doesn't understand what a crumb your wife is and so you're not going to obey that and, you know, and guess what you do to your heart? Scar tissue. Do enough of that, you'll be reprobate. Do enough of that, you will no longer be able to hear the Spirit because you have built so much scar tissue in your life that you will not be able to hear. 
and you will not know right from wrong. Now, we can argue tonight, and I don't know, can a Christian ever get to where their heart is completely covered? Whew, I don't know. I, I've met a couple Christians, I might argue so. But here's what I'll tell you. If you, know, you want to argue and say, no, I don't think a Christian ever can, then I think you end up in 1 Corinthians where it says, all right, that guy, that gal has gone so far, just turn him over to Satan so God can kill him. Because they're so embarrassing to the name of Jesus Christ. Better that God take them home than they keep living in that much discord and bringing so much disgrace. But here's what I will tell you. Whether or not you can completely cover your heart with scar tissue as a Christian, you can sure make your heart so darn hard close. And this also happens, I think, that much more readily in the heart of a non-believer because they don't have the Holy Spirit there trying to keep the prodding going. And you've run into people like this. You've run into people that no matter what you say, no matter how much God spanks them, no matter how bad life gets, they can't hear it. And I think that's exactly what Romans chapter 1 is talking about. You keep resisting God, you keep turning God down, the terrifying thing is that you may stop hearing God. So, here's my encouragement for those of us who are Christ followers, who are Christians in the room. Do not let scar tissue build up on your heart. When God speaks, the correct answer is, yes, sir. And don't live your life as a selective believer. Don't you dare let your heart get hard. Keep it tender and soft and fresh. And when those moments come when you hate what that verse says in the Bible, welcome to the club. Because we've all been there. We've all had moments where we said, man, I wish that wasn't sin, and I wish God wasn't asking me to sacrifice that, and I wish God wasn't asking me to be obedient. But the reality is, guys, when you signed up for Jesus, you signed up to follow. Remember what Jesus said? If anyone comes after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. If you're not ready to turn your back on your mother and your father, you're not ready to be in the boat. Follow me. Keep your heart soft. Obey the first time he asks. Questions? Yeah, all right, there we go. I knew I gave at least one other room. So my question is this, though. After you do do all of this and your heart is hard, when you start repenting, then it starts getting softer again, correct? Yes, yes. So eventually you get, get back to that smooth surface. Yes. So I, I, I do believe that. I believe that as you begin to behave in repentance, the Holy Spirit has the capacity to now come back and start restoring the heart, making it soft again. What you need to know is <clears throat> that that's not going to probably happen overnight. That once you've allowed that scar tissue to build, it's probably going to take an extended period for the Holy Spirit to work all that scar tissue out of you because you've learned so clearly how to be defensive with God. Right? But yes, I, the other, I, do, I don't want to leave us with no hope. I truly believe that as you begin to go back to some of those things that before you resisted God in and before you said no to God in, if you will now change the answer and say, God, I'm choosing to obey you there, that God then does come back and begin to restore the pliable part of that heart. Thank you for saying that. See, I would have forgotten that, so thank you. That's why questions work right there. What else? Yep. I just, I wanted to say something about the pagan people where they built their gods and they even though they could see things around them and they got really deep into sin, um, well, number one, doesn't, don't humans have a, they can see God. I mean, you, you've got to know that God exists just looking around you. But I think many people, I've heard this over and over, especially when they go through tough times or whatever, they want to physically see a God, mm -hmm. physically worship something that they can see that where it gives it value or something. So that's why they created their idols to worship. And so at, in that case, as people get deeper into sin and start doing, well, whatever, so-and-so is doing it, and we worship this God and that God, and they give themselves over to each other, 
their hearts just become hardened and they're, then they're just totally out of it. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, I, as long we, as you're grand. Yeah. You know, we said last week and we were talking and, you know, I did a little bit tongue in cheek. I think it's interesting that the pagans, remember we're talking about the pagans here, the heathens, that they went out and carved little stone gods and you and I all think we're so much more sophisticated than that and we go, oh, I, I, oh, sheesh. I mean, cause stop and think about it. If you carve a stone god, you carved it. It was a stick. You know, it was a piece of rock before you did it. Right? I mean, that, I mean, it's just, that's, I don't know about you, but I mean, to me, that's, that's wacky. The best use of that rock is hitting the guy in the head. Don't carve it, right? So I, I don't get that. But I'm going to tell you guys, how, how much further removed are that when you and I worship our cars? When you and I worship our, our jobs? When you and I worship our houses? Guys, why would we ever let those things be a consuming priority in our lives? They're all man-made. They're man-made. And, and there is none of it that is worth your worship. And there is none of it that's worth your attention. It's just not. It's all man-made. All right. All right, so back to the passage. Um, verse 29. They became filled. So these are the people that have gone to their depraved mind. They became filled. This is verse 29 with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They were full of envy and murder and strife. Okay, so let's, let's back up. Let me just, real quick. Uh, they became filled with wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They were filled with envy. They wanted what other people had. Murder, they were willing to kill to get what they wanted. Strife, they were argumentative about it. Uh, deceit, uh, they were willing to be dishonest in order to get it, and malice and anger at each other. They are gossipers and slanderers. What's the difference between a gossiper and a slanderer? Isn't that interesting? So it says one is a gossip, one is a slanderer. Er, er, er. What's the difference between gossip and slander? Could be, and I think that may be it. Gossip, gossip can be the truth. See, you can take the truth and be sharing it in places that are inappropriate to share it. And it's gossip. It's truth. And that's why you and I feel justified because we go, well, no, 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 I mean, it's true. I was there, I saw it, it's true. But you're giving information that is not helpful. It's only hurtful for you to share it. So it's gossip. Slander is when I'm saying things that are untruthful in order to attack a person, okay? So there's the potential difference. When is it gossip? And then a great question, when is it gossip? Because before that, it's a prayer request, right? Just, I just need you to pray for Sally. I'm just telling you, her marriage is on the rocks. I, you know, just, can we just join together? Okay, so when does it move from prayer request to gossip? We had one mic, yeah. I, I had a question about uh, verse 27. Okay, so we're going to wait because we're going to finish gossip real quick, but you're going to keep the microphone. All right, so when is it gossip? When does something become gossip? Gossip is when it's inappropriate to say it at an inappropriate time. How do I know that? Because I'm just going to tell you, some of us in this room think it's always appropriate. Because you wouldn't say it if Jesus was next to you. Ah! It's okay. I hope if you have that filter, okay. So, I mean, some, I'm just telling you, the way some of us live, you know, we, we would do some pretty wild stuff in front of Jesus. So, some of the movies we go to, I'm not sure Jesus would go to that movie, but that's okay. That's okay. So that's a great question. Is it gossip when they're not there and it's slandering when they are? I don't think so. I don't, I, that's a good shot at it, but I, I don't think that's the, the right way to, because here's the deal. Aren't there moments in which somebody's not in the room and you might even be saying some things about that person that are not flattering? 
but you're sharing them in a desire to be helpful. Isn't that possible? When is it gossip? Last week, I think you said gossip is when you're sharing it with somebody who cannot help or not change the situation. Okay. Like a third party. All right. So I'm going to offer that gossip is when you're sharing something with someone who has no chance of being part of the solution. Okay. So in other words, I'm sharing this information with you, but there's, there's, you're, you're not even interested in being part of the solution. You have no opportunity to be part of the solution. I'm just sharing this with you because it's a m nice, juicy morsel of information. Um, I think that gossip is when you don't have a genuine intent um, to uplift the person you're talking about. Okay, so that's, a, I'm with you right there. I think you're exactly right. So when I, if I'm, in other words, I may say something about somebody that's absolutely truthful but is not flattering, but I'm saying it because I'm trying to be helpful. Let me see if I can come up with a quick one on that. Um, All right, so let's say, let's say there's somebody on the church staff, we're making a totally imaginary person, and let's say that this person is hyper forgetful to ever schedule anything, okay? They, they just never schedule anything, and it causes constant chaos within the organization uh, to do that. If I stand in the lunchroom and I begin to share this with, um, let's say just one of their coworkers, and I go, well, you know John. I mean, John doesn't schedule anything. John's the most forgetful guy, and then everybody gets blown up, and everybody has to do the work for John because John doesn't schedule anything. I just gossiped. But I could walk down the hallway, walk into the office of one of John's coworkers and say, hey, you know what? Uh, I think we both know John's struggling in this part of his life. He's not He's not remembering. Could you and I make a commitment together that we're going to try to once a week just check in with John and say, hey, John, did you schedule the things you need to schedule this week? And if we see something coming up and he's talking about an event that's coming, could we just remember when he starts talking about events and say, hey, did you actually get that on the church calendar? Well, now I still talked about the same issue, right? I still talked about the fact that John always forgets. But I did this with an absolute heart and a spirit to actually help John, right? And I'm enlisting someone else to come help with it. And so I'm asking someone to come be part of the solution in order to benefit John. Does that make sense at all? And I'm not doing this to hurt John. I'm not doing it to do, I'm actually doing it in order to be helpful to John's life. Yes. Is it gossip when your intent is to diminish the person you're talking about? Yes. Yes. Doesn't Scripture say, let all communication be that which builds up, not diminishes, right? And, I, you know, I, I want to be careful with this, guys, because so here I am, I'm a pastor, and, uh, you know, someone may come to me and say, hey, there's this guy, and he's got a ministry over there, and he's doing this stuff. You know, I, I've got to be very careful when someone comes because he may be doing things in his ministry that I really think are unhealthy, right? And so now I'm left in a moment when I've got a person who's in the church who maybe is reading a book or watching a sermon this person does, but I happen to have information that I know that there's some things going on that are unhealthy in that. And so, you know, I've got to be very careful as a pastor to not degrade that other minister, or degrade that other church, or degrade that other ministry, and yet potentially say, hey, you know what? without being gossipy, without, you know, being mean or hurtful, there's some unhealth over there that you may just want to be aware of. You may just want to be aware that not everything is really probably as it should be. I'm doing that, okay, in that moment because I'm trying to keep the person that I'm talking to from receiving harm. Does that make sense? I don't want them to start donating to that ministry and then find out that all their money went to a waste or I don't want them to get involved in something, find out their doctrine was weird for 10 years, right? So again, you, you've got to be careful. What is my motive? Is my motive to degrade somebody? Is my motive to be a solution, to be helpful to somebody in this moment? Okay, yeah. 
I always thought of gossip as it always has like a secretive component. Hmm. It's it's always a, like a sense of intimacy. I, like a lot of the times affairs start in marriages when two people start to gossip about hmm. their spouse to each other and there's kind of an intimate component. This, this is why we like it so much, right? There is this kind of exactly. secret lasciviousness to the conversation. And even if it doesn't go that far, it, it, there, there is that part of it. There's a show on TV right now, right, called Gossip? Yes, no? You're going, I'm a Christian. I don't know about that show. What, what do you mean? Yeah. Okay. I think it's almost egotistical, too, because there's times where you have information that somebody else doesn't have. And here you are wanting to, you know, spread the news. Oh, did you, you hear so-and-so? You feel really affirmed because you right. were in the know. Right. And then you feel, and you owe me something because I just put you in the know, right? So it's like now you owe me a turn, right? Now I'm with you. To me, gossip's pretty simple. If I'm talking about you and you're not in the room to defend yourself, whether I said something bad or positive and different, it's gossip. You're not there. I'm talking about you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back on you, and I love that because that's actually a very safe definition of gossip, and if you stay with that, you're going to stay out of trouble. I'm going to suggest there's times when you, it's, it's appropriate to talk to, about somebody who's not in the room. Um, uh, so, whoops, I think those times can be hey, I'm talking, I'm talking to someone who I'm enlisting to be part of the solution. I'm enlisting them to be helpful with this. The other is I may be talking to someone who's part of the problem. So let, let me give you another example. Let's say, and again, none of these are real. I'm making all these up, okay? Um, <clears throat> Let's say I sit in a, in a staff meeting and I happen to know that anger gets kind of carried away in the room. And that what happens in the process is it stops being about the issue and starts being about snide comments. Uh, and so this one's snipping and then this one's snipping and this one's snipping and you know, finally you go, hey, wait, 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 and we call it off. But the reality is you leave the room, the tension's still there, right? And, uh, and so now I, I go into one of the rooms and I say, hey, Tom, I just want to talk to you about that because that, that got a little weird in there. And I think we were a little bit hurtful with each other in there. And, uh, and uh, Tom says, what do you mean? I was totally justified. And I go, well, Tom, I don't think you were. There was a couple comments you made that, that really were hurtful. And he goes, yeah, but I would have never said them if Jeff hadn't said this. Well, in that moment, I may say to Tom, Tom, you know what? I think you're right. And the truth is I'm probably going to go talk to Jeff about a couple of his comments next, and so I'm, I'm not telling you that Jeff was blameless, and I'm, I'm willing to agree with you on that. Jeff's not in the room when I'm saying this right, but Tom, you own the fact that you threw gasoline on the fire. You only inflamed that situation, and it could have easily just been turned off if you would have simply said, let's talk about it later, right? So I've gone to somebody now who was part of the problem, and I'm working through the problem. Now, to your credit, probably what I'm going to do with Tom before it's all said and done is say, hey, I, I need you to go talk to Jeff now. I, ne I need to send you to Jeff uh, for the next part of the conversation, okay? But I do think, I think there's times it's okay for that person you're talking about to not be in the room. Here's all I'm going to say is, you better be talking to other people who are a direct part of the problem, so you're trying to solve this, or you're talking to people that you're enlisting to help you help Jeff or help Tim or help that other person, so they're going to be part of the solution for you, okay? And in that moment, because now the truth is both of those things you're fixing and building, which then preclude it from being gossip if you're fixing and building, because now you're edifying the relationship. But let's be honest, 90% of the time when we're talking about someone else, it has nothing to do with fixing and building. It has to do with diminishing and therefore would be gossip, okay? Question real quick, if I keep moving. Um, it's not a question, but it's about gossip. Okay. Um, I think that gossip is about when you talk about something and you only feel better about talking about it. Say it again. I think gossip is when you talk about somebody else 
and you feel better about talking about it. Hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons we do it a lot. I think, I think we make ourselves feel better by making the other person feel lower. And that, think about how horrible that is, though. I'm going to feel better about me by diminishing you. I mean, that's, that's, isn't that just, if you think, isn't that darkness? I'm going to feel better about me by diminishing you. Time? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. All right. Got to keep going. We're going to get through chapter one tonight. All right. Hang on, guys. We're going to go as fast as we can. All right. Um, slanderers, haters of God, verse 30, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They are disobedient to parents. Isn't it? Think about this, guys. I want to toss this out. How interesting is it to you in this very, 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 very dark list, right? They were, they were gossipers and slanderers and murderers and adulterers. Dark list. And in the list, it includes disobedient to parents. How do you think disobedient to parents slipped in there? Come on. I mean, on the list of sins, that ought to be like one of the you know, everybody does it sins, right? Why do you think that one slipped in there? Why do you think that God kind of put that in the big deal list? Isn't that interesting? Anybody got any thoughts? Yeah. Microphone, microphone, microphone. It's one of the commandments. It's one of the commandments. But why? Why? Why did that even make it there? Isn't that interesting? Why is disobedient to parents a big deal? Okay, we got more hands. We have people who are thinking. People are, people are, their brains are frying. This is a good question. Yeah. Well, I think it's a responsibility of parents to train their children up in the ways of the Lord, and being disobedient to, the, to their parents is, in a way, disobeying God himself. Okay, I'll go with you there. I think we're getting in the ballpark. I think that we can be kept from so much harm to ourselves if we listen to our parents. I think God's trying to protect us. I would agree. I think, I think any time, guys, here, here, here's it. When God places authority in our lives, okay, and, and this goes even for bad authorities, this goes for your jerk of a boss at work, the Bible says that basically they're like a covering and that as long as you stay under that in obedience, there's harm that never touches your life because you've stayed under authority. And the minute you step out and go, I'm not going to listen to my authority, you immediately expose yourself to all sorts of discipline uh, in your life. And, uh, and I think you're true. I think obeying parents saves us from a world of hurt. Parents are supposed to be our followers. We're supposed to be followers of our parents. Look up to them when we need answers. And when we got questions, we ought to be able to turn to them or someone, hmm. one of our higher up adults. Hmm. Respect them and hmm. give them respect. Okay, I like it. I like where we're going. All right, we got one there. Thank you for waving your hand and helping your microphone get attention. Okay. I think it's a matter of authority and, and kind of an order of things that God places hmm. in every one of us, that when you start disrespecting that order, hmm. it, like others have said, you start disrespecting God. Hmm. You start going in that, in that down. All right. Path. So I love that our hands are up. I, hate, I, I love that our hands are up, but we're running out of time, and Frankie's going to yell at me. So let, let, me, let me toss you a little bit of low-hanging. No, I can't, I can't, I can't. Let me toss you a little bit of low-hanging fruit real quick and maybe something to think about as we get out of here. Here's why I think this is a big deal, guys. Every teenager that disobeys their parents, why do they disobey their parents? What do they say? Mom and dad are dumb. Dumb. Mom and dad just don't understand. They don't get it. All my friends are doing it. The world's changed. They grew up when dinosaurs walked the earth. I don't know. Right? Right? Every time a Christian obeys God, disobeys God, what do we say? God's dumb. God doesn't get it. He wrote the Bible thousands of years ago. He doesn't understand. This is the 21st century. Ah, yeah, yeah. And here's the, here's the thing, guys, I think is absolutely, if you can't obey a parent you can see, 
you will always struggle to obey the parent you can't. And what does God describe himself to us over and over and over and over and over and over and over again in Scripture? I am your heavenly Father. You show me a young person who struggles to obey their parents, and I will bet you money they will struggle to obey God. Because if you can't obey your Father whom you can see and hear, you will struggle to obey the God who you have to seek. And guys, I'm just going to say this. This is free stuff for you that are parents in this room. Your job is not to be your children's friend. Your job is to be your children's parent. And one of the most powerful lessons you ever teach your child is obedience. And you go, Lynn, that's archaic and it's old. No, it's not. Your job is to hand your child off to God, a fully functioning adult, who knows and understands biblical authority, okay? Let, let me give you three phases real quick. Let me give you real quick three phases that every parent has to lead their child through if your child's gonna be healthy. The first one is fear of discipline. And, and you can disagree with me all you want. You can get mad at me all you want. But I'm just going to say, moms and dads, you've got a little two-year-old, and your two-year-old's getting ready to touch the light socket, and they shouldn't do it. You slap the hand. You don't sit down with your two-year-old and go, now, Tommy, <laughs> let me explain to you about electricity, Tommy. You slap their hand. I'm not talking about being brutal. I'm not talking about being abusive. I'm talking about you've got to make what they want to do not worth the expense of doing it, okay? It's the fear of discipline because one of the most powerful things that a child is, or an adult has got to know when they go out in the, into the world is, you know why I'm not gonna disobey that scripture? Because God said he'd spank me if I did. And I fear his discipline. We have a generation that does not fear God and does not fear that he'll spank them. And they've taken his long suffering and abused it. And somewhere, our generation's going to get a spanking because we never learned to fear discipline. The second thing that every parent, and it's the next phase, this is part of a child growing up. Whoops, I have no idea what that was. Okay, there we go. The next one is to fear disappointment. If you can teach your child to fear disappointing you as a parent, and this is going to happen, guys, you get your kid's going to get big enough that you can't give them a swat that matters, right? I remember being about nine years old, my mom put me over my knee and I laughed, right? There, there, there's going to be a place where physical discipline just doesn't matter anymore, and even taking away the phone doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. And what you want to have turned was their heart before that, and now they fear disappointment. You want, guys, you ready for this? You want your 16-year-old daughter in the backseat of that car when that boy begins to reach under her blouse to say, I can't. And she's not going to say, I can't, because daddy will spank me when I go home. That's not what she's going to say. She's got to be able to say in that moment, I can't, because I don't want to see my father's eyes if he knows we did. And I fear disappointing him. It's one of the most powerful lessons you can ever teach your children. I don't want to disappoint my parents, okay? Fear of discipline, fear of disappointment. And the last one, if you can get to this final phase, you have raised an amazing young adult. It's the desire to please. Hey, why did you do that? I did that because I knew it would make my parents proud. Why did you study so hard in school? I did that so much because I knew my parents would be proud. Why did you go help that homeless person? I did that because I knew it would make my parents proud. Not because I thought I'd get a spanking. Not, I did it to make them proud. And if you can hand off a young adult who lives their life to make God proud, you raised a pretty darn good adult. Okay? Three phases of parenting. All right. Let me read the last verse and then we're done. Here we go. Here we go. So we can say we got through. Although they know God's righteous decree and those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do those things, but also approve those who practice them. Oh, we got to talk about that next week. Okay. All right. So we, we, one verse next week. Let's pray. We got to get out of here. The childcare people are cursing at us even as we speak. Let's pray. Hey, dear Lord Jesus, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word, which is true. God, help us to be great students of your word. God, and, and please don't let it be head knowledge. Let it be life practice. 
God, that we would take the words that we've heard tonight and we would live them in the world and that our world would be compelled to know our God because our lives are so different from what we do. God, thank you for this privilege and the moment of just being in Scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you guys for being here.